Okay, so we're starting uh, a new topic uh, this week. It's going to last a couple of weeks, a few weeks. Um, so this video is going to cover everything, um, but um, uh, I'll probably post the worksheets in uh, you know um, different worksheets each week so that we build up our sort of um, understanding and work on the topic. So just to, as a sort of little starter, what I'd like you to do is just think about or list maybe five things that make a sound and then I want you to think about how they make that sound. So um, probably best now to just pause the video, uh, make a list, have a think about how they make that sound and then um, we'll just carry on. So do you want to pause, just pause the video for a second then? So if you think back to work uh, that you did in year seven um, uh, on energy, uh, one of the things that you may remember uh, is that uh, sound waves um, or sound waves transfer energy. So we've got carry here, but I'm just going to add transfer. Okay, so they transfer, sound waves are a transfer of energy. Um, so you did stores and transfers. Um, and for sound to come about, there needs to be something that vibrates. So if something is vibrating, there is a possibility of it producing sound waves. Um, and so there's a possibility of it, uh, of energy being transferred. So if you look at these pictures, maybe think about what's vibrating uh, in these pictures. Um, that, the top one on the top right probably isn't clear what it is, but they are in fact your vocal cords. Okay, so they're in your throat. Um, we've got in the bottom left, um, we've got a violinist, possibly cello. It's quite difficult to tell actually, but let's just assume it's the violin. Uh, we've got a hockey player, so I think um, the sound you've got to think about is the maybe the thwack of the ball. Uh, so when the hockey player hits the ball, you hear that sort of thwack noise. Um, so what's vibrating? How, how is that um, sound arising, as it were? Um, the headphones, so many of you probably have headphones, so think about what's vibrating, um, because obviously you hear sound through um, headphones. And then uh, you can see in the bottom right, um, we've got a drummer. Of course, what's actually vibrating when um, drums are struck or hit. Um, I am also going to post a, a video um, as well that looks at some of these things. So um, when you look, when you go through this lesson, also make sure you look at the other videos that I uh, include on Google Classroom. Anyway, have a think about uh, whether there are more examples of um, things that produce sound. Uh, that you can think of and um, think about what might what be vibrating in those particular scenarios too. Okay, so we've uh, established that sounds are vibrations. Um, so that's all well and good, but how does that actually relate to sound being transferred? Um, how do we manage to hear those drums? How do we manage to hear uh, whatever uh, it is that we're hearing, that thwack of the hockey stick on the ball? Um, so we're just going to consider vocal cords for an example. Although it has a speaker in the in the bottom left, just imagine um, that's that could easily have been your vocal cords. So when you speak, your vocal cords are vibrating. They sort of vibrate from side to side. Because your vocal cords are sort of in your throat, there is air around them. So the vibration of those vocal cords causes the air, air around the, vib uh, the cords to vibrate also. And then those vibrations then pass on through the air until eventually they reach your eardrum and then you hear the actual sound. So uh, whatever's vibrating in the first place, so in our picture here we've got a speaker, okay, so we've got the speaker here sort of vibrating. Um, that basically uh, causes the air next to it to, to vibrate, which then causes the air particles next to that and the air particles next to that, and we get a transfer of sound basically to our air due to those vibrations passing through the air. So it can be quite a hard thing to picture. Um, so we're going to just uh, use a slinky. It's a shame we can't physically use a slinky, but maybe you've got one at home, um, possibly from the past, and you could also have a go at that. So um, in year seven, you did do um, you did do light, okay. And then hopefully one of the things that you learned about light was that uh, light is a transverse wave, okay. Now, in our slinky example, what that means is if we um, moved or shook our slinky from side to side, we would see that there was a wave created. 
um, one that looks more like your conventional wave that you might think about when you think about waves. Uh, it's moving up and down, cores are vibrating up and down. You can see that sort of wave pass along the uh, slinky in a sort of up and down way. And we describe those transverse waves as moving at 90 degrees um, to the direction of travel. So the direction of travel uh, is um, going from the hand in this instance. Okay, so that's the direction of travel. Um, but the, um, the wave itself is moving at 90 degrees. So there's our 90 degrees to that direction of travel. Okay. Uh, now when we look at... Um, Sound waves, uh, they are different. Um, they are longitudinal waves. Uh, so what that means is that they vibrate in line with the direction of travel. So the direction of travel is still the same. Okay, that's the overall direction of travel. Uh, but the actual vibration uh, within the uh, wave itself is in line with that direction. So there's a sort of vibration within the whole line all the way down like that so if you it's imagine what you're doing is that you are pushing your slinky and what you would see is uh, by pushing your slinky you would see this travel all the way down the slinky and there's another one there so this person's pushed it twice um, so they are longitudinal waves it can be quite difficult to visualize so please do look at the other videos that i post uh, along with um, this video um, in your Google Classroom so that you can um, see it demonstrated more clearly. So here are two more diagrams uh, trying to illustrate what we've just been talking about. Uh, the top one um, introduces a couple of new terms for us to think about. So um, one of the things, we're going to look at wavelength later, so I'm not going to talk really much about wavelength because we're going to um, pay much more attention to it later. What we can think about here, these two words, one where it says compression and one where it says uh, rarefraction, okay? Uh, so compression is where the particles are really close together. So in our slinky, it was where the um, spring coils are very close together, but we saw those tight spring coils move along uh, the slinky, or we would see that if we were watching it. Um, if you look at the diagram at the bottom, which is, gives you a much greater sense, I think, of uh, the particles, um, we can see areas of compression, okay, where they are sort of, we've got lots of particles sort of very close together, and then we can see areas of rare refraction in between, where there are fewer particles or there's greater spacing between the particles. So these are just two terms to describe aspects, or parts, sorry, of uh, longitudinal waves. And um, what we would see is we would see um, say this first compression if we think about the first compression on the left if we were watching this in real time we would see that compression moving to the right assuming it was going from left to right and we'd see the other one moving to the right and we'd see the one moving to the right so we'd see those compressions moving along in a um, linear direction um, and, and and that's how we would be witnessing this longitudinal wave Again, just a, a, a different type of image. Um, here we've got the idea of a tuning fork. So one of the things that a, a tuning fork does is that um, when you hit it or strike it or you knock it against something uh, that sort of vibrates, these metal parts vibrate and they in turn um, cause the air particles, they hit the air particles around them which hit the air particles next to them, which hit the air particles next to them, etc, etc. Um, so this is just giving us the sense of a sound wave in a th sort of, I guess, in a more two-dimensional sense or three-dimensional sense, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, we can see that the sound uh, is radiating away from the tuning fork. We can see that we have uh, areas of compression. Okay, so there's a ring there. Uh, we can also see that we've got areas of rarefication, okay, where there is spaces between the particles. But we would see um, those compressions and those rarefications, we would see them moving in a direction, okay. So they would come, be coming away from uh, the tuning fork there. 
So just something for you to think about um, briefly. Um, if you think about what you see and hear during a thunderstorm, try and sort of pause uh, and try and think about as, in as much detail as you can what you do actually see and hear and why that might be um, relevant perhaps um, to the sort of things that we're discussing here. So have a pause, have a think about it. Um, are there any... Any, is there anything interesting about that? And, and what we'll probably do is return to it towards the end of this video. So I'm not sure if you realise this or not, but sound cannot travel in space. Um, so space is a vacuum. Um, vacuum means that there's an, there are no other there are no particles. There is an absence of particles. Um, so um, obviously there are planets and things. So there are particles within space, but space as a medium uh, is a vacuum. So there are no outer particles in space, um, and you can't, the sound cannot travel in space. There was a, a very famous film poster, which I've got here on the right, um, in the late 70s, a film called Alien, um, and they had this wonderful strap line, if you can see it, sort of about two thirds down, it says, in space, no one can hear you scream. And, and that's scientifically correct. Um, so one of the things that uh, knowing that sound doesn't travel in space tells us is that it sort of proves the fact that sound needs particles uh, in order to be able to travel. Um, so you need those particles to hit the next one, to hit the next one, to hit the next one. You, you need those vibrations to travel along a medium or across through a medium. So of course there are different types of mediums. We've been focusing on air, and air is a gas, or is a mixture of gases rather. Um, but there are, you know, again from year seven and just from everyday life, you know there are also solids and liquids. Um, and sound can travel through solids and liquids, and you know that because you will have heard uh, things, say, from your next-door neighbours, which is clearly travelling through the walls, or you may have heard uh, things from classrooms when we were back in classrooms, other classrooms, and uh, you probably heard things when you've been swimming and you've been underwater, um, you will have been able to hear sound as well. Perhaps not amazingly, but you've definitely been able to hear it. So I want you to think about, um, given what we've said about sound uh, traveling because particles hit adjacent particles which hit, which hit adjacent particles and so on. I want you to think about which medium, and by medium here I'm talking about a solid liquid and, and gas, uh, through which of those mediums does sound travel the fastest. And I want you not only to think about which one you think it travels fastest through, but also why you think it travels fastest through that particular medium. So just pause the video um, just before I explain that a little bit more. Well, I hope you came to the conclusion uh, that sound travels fastest through a solid. Okay, so sound travels fast through a solid. Why would that be? Well, if we've got to have uh, particles colliding with adjacent particles and that being the transfer of the vibration, and clearly we've got very closely packed particles in a solid, so we're gonna very get a very easy transfer of energy through that uh, through that medium. A liquid would be the next, uh, would be where sound traveled the next fastest. Um, again, the particles are not, well, they're not as tightly packed as they are, or closely packed as they are in a um, solid, but they are fairly closely packed, fairly tightly packed, so we get a, a good transfer of sound. And actually, uh, the least, effective medium or the one where the sound would travel the slowest is in fact the one that we rely on the most to in terms of how we hear things in everyday life and that um uh, that it would be gases um because here the particles are much further apart um so the transfer uh, of sound is much slower because um there are fewer the particles are less densely packed and so those vibrations pass on um less effectively than they do in solids and liquids. Uh, it can be quite difficult to um, visualise um, sound waves uh, in any meaningful sense in terms of thinking about how loud they are or what pitch they are, whether they're high pitched, low pitched. Um, and something that helps us um, visualise um, sound waves um, is an something called an oscilloscope. So essentially, it will turn our longitudinal wave into a transverse wave. In terms of visualising it, picturing it, 
so we get much we get a much easier way of judging um, frequency and frequency is going to be important to us because frequency is going to tell us the pitch of a sound so whether it's high pitched or whether low pitch so whether it's high note or a low note okay so high pitch high pitch low pitch and the other thing that um, it um, helps us um, appreciate better is the amplitude of the town of the sound so that's basically volume here so we could have a small low low amplitude or we could have a high amplitude and so we can see that there's a difference in the volume there okay so I'm going to try and draw a wave uh, hopefully this is going to be okay so apologies if this looks pretty terrible um, so I'm going to do it oh dear I've messed that up haven't I or maybe not I'll keep going So, um, hmm. I'm sure you could do better than that, but anyway, um, we'll live with it for the moment. Uh, so, we've got uh, different features on our wave. Uh, so, we have something called the rest point. Okay, so, wave is really moving about that position. Uh, so then, the difference between the rest point and the highest or lowest points and these should be the same so I have drawn them deliberately two squares uh, two squares difference from the lowest to the from the rest point sorry to the highest point of the peak or the trough um, okay that's something else I should just so that's a peak and that's a trough and uh, the distance between the rest point and the peak and the trough is called the amplitude okay so that would be the amplitude for this sound wave and then the other thing that we've got going on is the distance between two identical points on the wave so i'm just pick those two it could have been um, the difference uh, between two peaks or between two troughs but I've done the difference between um, the rest point where it's starting to rise and the next rest point where it's starting to rise. Uh, and that represents, so it's going to be a little bit trickier to do, uh, but that represents the wavelength. Okay. So this is a, a slightly better uh, diagram. Although I get realise now that actually one thing that is a little bit odd about this diagram is it looks like uh, the difference between the rest line or the rest position and the peak and the rest position and the trough are different. They should be the same. So the amplitudes should be identical, um, so just to make that clear. Okay, so maybe my previous diagram or the one on the previous slide was better because it did actually make it clear there were two squares, uh, both the trough and the, and the peak. So I spoke briefly about uh, pitch and amplitude, and we're going to look at those a little bit more closely, and um, particularly how we can judge pitch and amplitude using um, the transverse star wave that the oscilloscope is able to show us. Um, remember, though, that sound is still a longitudinal wave, so even though we might represent it using this transverse shape, um, it is still fundamentally a longitudinal wave. We're just sort of converting it pictorially to allow us to understand appreciate things a little bit better um, so if the vibrations are very fast we get a high-pitched um, sound um, if they're moving very fast they that means that the wave has a high frequency um, and then when the vibrations are slow we have a, a low frequency and we have a low pitch sound okay so we're going to look at that visually in a second and um, when vibrations are big, um, in terms of, you know, you put a lot of effort, you know, let's say you bang the drum very, very hard, um, there's, a, there's a greater energy transfer, and you get a loud sound, um, so the vibrations are bigger. So what we're going to see is a higher amplitude, or a larger amplitude, and then if we hit something more softly, or speak more softly, uh, then we're going to have a quieter sound, we're going to have a smaller amplitude. 
Okay, um, just before we move on, I think it would be beneficial for us to have a definition for frequency, um, one that was uh, very clearly applicable um, here. So we define frequency as the number of waves that pass a fixed point per unit time. Um, in fact, the unit it has a specific unit uh, in science, and that unit is hertz. Okay, and actually hertz is measured as per second. Um, so one, uh, sorry, per second. So if there's a frequency of five hertz, then we're saying that um, five waves are passing a, a point per second. 20 hertz, 20 waves passing a point per second. So we get a sense that the higher the number, um, 100 hertz compared to five hertz, um, the 100 hertz is a higher frequency. There are far more waves passing a point per second than um, with 5 hertz. So this hopefully makes uh, it um, easier to under appreciate um, visually. So at the top, um, we have got the same wavelength, right? So what we're doing, if we're keeping the same wavelength, we're keeping the pitch of the sound the same. But we do have a difference in the amplitude. And so the larger the amplitude, um, let's just actually show that. So the the wavelength on uh, the one at the top, that wavelength, the difference between, say, the two crests is the same. Okay, so there's no difference in wavelength. There's no difference in um, the frequency. There's no difference in the pitch. And what we do have a difference in, though, is the amplitude. So this is one square, okay, uh, whereas this one is two squares. So uh, if we were comparing... Um, those two sounds, uh, this would be louder because it has a larger amplitude and this would be quieter. Okay, but the same pitch because the wavelength is the same. Okay, so same for both of them. Okay, if we want to look at the one at the bottom, uh, one of the things, let's just look then first of all at the amplitude. Well, we can see that it's two squares and we can see that it's also two squares. So the amplitude's the same, so the volume is going to be the same. And what we do have a difference in is the wavelength. Okay, so we can see that's what, or we can see there's a difference anyway, even if they're not beautifully or easily easy to for them to see the exact dif uh, differences in length. Um, so the one on the right uh, has a shorter wavelength, so it's a higher frequency. You can think of frequencies as um, how many waves pass a point in a given time. Um, so if you've ever been to the seaside or something, if you had a high frequency of waves, you would get lots of waves reaching you or crashing in on the shore. Uh, you get it happening more frequently. You could say they were almost, they were passing a point, there were more waves passing point per unit time compared with um, something with a lower frequency. So uh, what we've got here, um, we've got a lower pitch on the left, and we've got a higher pitch. Okay, um, but they are uh, the same volume because they have the same amplitude. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to try and attempt to draw oscilloscope traces. Um, for a loud and high pitch tone, a loud and low pitch tone, a quiet and high pitch tone, and a quiet and low pitch tone. Um, bearing in mind it's not terribly easy to do on an iPad. You can already see that my rest positions are not the straightest lines in the world, but I'll obviously do my best. Okay, so here goes. So uh, loud, I'm going to go up. Sorry, I really should have just done this, haven't I? Shouldn't I? And not try to talk it through. Okay, right. So let's, that's not really going to make much sense until I do the next one. So here we go. So I'm showing it's the same volume by having the same amplitude, but I'm showing it's lower pitch by having a longer wavelength. Um, so let's just show that. Uh, so just so, so you can see the amplitude, make that consistent. So the amplitude is two squares on both of them. That's why they are both going to be loud in my example here. 
But if I look at the wavelength, if I choose that point to that point, we can see that's how many four squares. And if I choose the same here, it must be eight. Okay, so we have a uh, same volume because they have the both. They're both the same amplitude. Uh, they have different pitches um, because the one on the left. Um, if we just even look, we've essentially got two waves taking place in that just the um, number of grids that I've drawn, and we've got essentially one wave in the one that I've drawn on the right. So we have different frequencies, higher frequency on the left, a higher pitch. Okay, if I now try and do quiet and high pitched. So let's start in basically the same place. Okay, so I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, let's do the next one. So um, quieter, low pitch. Okay, all right, so let's just show the amplitudes. Um, And then let's just show the wavelengths. Okay. So I hope what you can see is it's quieter compared to, so the bottom left is quieter compared to the top left um, because it has a smaller amplitude, but they're both high pitched uh, because they both have the shorter wavelength. Um, the bottom right is quieter than the top right because it has a smaller amplitude. Uh, they're both low pitched because they have a longer wavelength. And then if you compare three and four, the amplitude's the same, so they're both the same volume, um, but the wavelengths are different, so the frequencies are different. Um, so we have a high pitched on the left and a low pitch on the right. So I hope that makes sense, but let me know if you've got any queries about that. Okay, so we're just going to have a few questions, um, or we'll work through a few um, scenarios and decide the answer. Um, so, pause the video, have a think yourself which one of these two ways represents the loudest sound. So just pause the video. So remember volume, um, we can set, get a gauge volume from amplitude. Uh, if we compare the amplitudes of the two uh, waves, we can see that A has a much greater amplitude. So A uh, must be louder, okay? We look at this one, we're considering um, which of them has the highest pitch. So pause the video and have a think about that. So pitch is to do with the frequency of the, of the wave or the sound, um, you know, um, how many waves pass a fixed point per unit time or per second. Um, given that they'll be the same sound, they're going to be traveling at the same speed, so that wavelength is giving us an idea. Wavelength is giving us an idea of frequency. So if we consider the wavelength, so the difference between two of the same point on the wave, uh, we can see that A has a much shorter wavelength. It's going to have a higher frequency, so it's going to be the higher pitch. Quite a sound, so again, uh, just pause the video, have a think about what you think your answer is and your reasons why. So volume is about amplitude. That's the difference between the rest position and either the peak or the trough. Uh, and we can see that um, A has a much larger amplitude. B has um, a smaller amplitude, so B is going to be quieter. Okay, lowest pitch, have a think about that, decide on what your answer is and why it's your answer. Pause the video. Okay, so about frequency, so we can consider frequency because they're traveling at the same speed, these waves, because they'll be the same type of sound. Um, sorry, they'll be traveling through the same medium, not the same type of sound, they'll be traveling through the same medium. Um, so we're considering wavelength, and clearly 
B has the larger wavelength, that means it's going to have a smaller frequency traveling through this medium. Uh, so that is the lower pitch. Have a think about this, decide on the answer, pause the video. A has the larger amplitude, um, so that is going to be the louder sound. Highest pitch, again, pause the video, have a think about which you think is the correct answer, and then um, we'll give a reason for your, justify your answer to. So A clearly has the shorter wavelength, um, so there's going to be more waves passing at a particular point per unit time, so A is going to be the higher pitch, because it's got the greatest frequency. Okay, so we're actually going to do some actual calculations uh, around um, waves, so I think this is going to help us understand um, some aspects of sound a little bit better. Um, so we've got um, our equation here, um, so speed, okay, the silly wave formula is a way of remembering the equation, um, so silly speed wave is to do with uh, wavelength okay now that has a unique symbol it's a Greek letter it's lambda the symbols called lambda um, and that represents in physics or in science really uh, wavelength and then finally we've got frequency so before we use the equation we've just got to confirm units so typically speed is in meters per second um, uh, frequency we've already said is per second uh, and wavelength will be measured in meters typically um, so you can see how meters times per second becomes meters per second for example okay so we're going to look at some questions now so here's the first question um, it's asking us to calculate the wave speed um, in meters per second uh, we've got a sound wave taking part in steel has a frequency of 500 Hertz uh, we just remind ourselves that um, hertz means uh, one is, means per second. Okay, so one over time or one over second. Yeah, we have a wavelength of three meters. So we're trying to work out speed. We know that it equals wavelength uh, times um, frequency. We know that the wavelength is three meters. And uh, we know that the frequency is 500 hertz. So we can do our calculation and it's 1500 meters per second, which is pretty fast. Okay, so this time we're being asked to calculate the wavelength um, and we're given the frequency and we're given the speed. So the first thing we need to do is we need to rearrange our equation. So there's our equation to start with. Um, we want um, wavelength on its own because that's what we're trying to work out. So we're going to divide both sides by frequency. So that removes frequency from the right um, and it means that on the left we now have speed over frequency equals wavelength. So let's put the numbers in. We have a speed of 3 meters per second. Uh, we have a frequency of 2 hertz, so our wavelength is going to be 1.5 meters. And then the final question, or example question we're going to look at, uh, we've got to calculate frequency uh, for a sound wave, and we're given the wavelength of 10 meters, and we're told that it's traveling at 314 meters uh, per second. So we have to rearrange the equation. Uh, we want frequency on its own. Um, so we're going to divide both sides by wavelength. So we get uh, speed divided by um, wavelength equals frequency. So let's put the numbers in. The speed was 340 meters per second. Uh, the wavelength is 10 meters. Uh, so we get a frequency of 340 hertz.
Okay, so we're just going to consider echoes now. Um, so echoes are or come about because sound is reflected. Um, but for it to really be an echo, um, it's got to uh, reflect and take at least 0.1 second to get back to you. Um, that's when you're going to hear it as an echo. Um, if you get a reflected sound that reaches your ear in less than 0.1 seconds, um, then you tend to um, we tend to call it something called a reverberation. So um, if we look at these five sort of um, possible scenarios, if you've ever been in a cave, I'm sure you've probably um, heard echoes when you've shouted or when you've spoken. Or oh, it could have been a tunnel, actually, um, that's very similar to a cave. So we would definitely get an echo in a cave. Um, they're normally quite large. They're large enough so that the sound takes more than 0.1 seconds to reflect back to us. On something like this playing field on the right hand side there is nothing really for the sound to reflect off um, so we would get no echo there at all um, it wouldn't even be about the time it took it would just be the fact that it didn't really reflect back to us um, I think the idea on the bottom left one is that we have got um, you know hard surfaces which the sound can reflect off it could reflect off the floor it could reflect off the ceiling and it could reflect off the walls as well so I think we would probably get the sense of an echo in that um, the one in the middle at the bottom um, that is uh, that's sort of like foam that they've got along the walls uh, foam shape with them um, that sort of pyramid -y, triangular shape and um, so it's a sort of type of foam this would be a soundproof room um, so we'll understand a little bit better in a second how it would work, but we would get no echo here. And then the shower. The shower is our example where we do have hard surfaces, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. So we would get sound sort of reflecting off. Um, but because it's quite a, a, a small space and, you know, the, dif dis the distance between the wall and us is quite is short, so it actually wouldn't take very long for the sound to come back to us. Uh, we would get much more sense of um, reverberation. So as already sort of basically hinted at on the previous slide, um, an echo is because you, because the sound wave bounces, bounces off or reflects. And for it to do that effectively, you need a flat, smooth surface. Um, so if you've ever, I don't know, moved flat or house or gone into a new house or whatever, one of the things that you'll notice is that when you walk into a room that may become your lounge or may become your whatever, um, it's very echoey. Um, so the room on the left, for example, you know, if you stood there and said something, uh, sound can bounce off lots of, there's lots of hard surfaces for the sound to, to sort of bounce off. Okay. But once it's uh, furnished, um, so once you've got your carpets in, once you've got your uh, curtains up, there might be rugs, there might be sofas that are made of fabric, etc. Um, then you'll find that the sound is very different, even though it's exactly the same room. And that's basically because soft furnishings or soft surfaces, they'll absorb the sound. So having a carpet, having, a, having curtains, um, having a sofa or rug or whatever, that absorbs more of the sound um, and you get less of it reflected so you get a much less uh, echoey room so if you want to reduce the echo in a room one of the things that you do is you make sure that there is as much soft materials as possible because they will absorb the sound rather than reflect it so the idea behind echoes um, actually has a, a very useful purpose in um, in nature um, so you may have heard of um, echolocation, which is how um, bats sense their surroundings. So bats use something called echolocation, um, and so high frequency waves are sort of sent out, and um, based on the reflection of those sound waves, uh, bats have a sense of their surroundings, um, but both physical surroundings, oh, well, both the fixed part aspects of the surroundings, you know, walls, trees etc but also anything that's moving anything that might be um, prey so in this example here a moth or a butterfly 
Similarly, um, dolphins, and dolphins are not the only creature to do this, um, but they will use sound waves and its reflections, and we call that sonar, um, again, to gauge their environment, to gauge their surroundings. So the idea, the principle behind echo is the principle of reflected sound waves, but they may be at a frequency that we can't hear. And it's very uh, useful, uh, very pertinent in aspects of nature like bats and dolphins. So I just mentioned that uh, those frequencies might be um, outside our, the range that we can hear. Um, and so uh, different creatures have different auditory ranges, i.e. different frequencies that they can, um, they can actually distinguish. So humans can hear sounds that have a frequency between about 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. That does change actually over our lifetime, particularly the upper end. So as we get older, um, that um, top end, that 20,000 hertz, tends to get lower. So actually, you can probably hear sounds that I can't hear, given that you're uh, much younger than me. Um, anything above 20,000 hertz we call ultrasound. Um, so you may have heard about ultrasound that's used in, in medicine, for example. Um, so that's one way that, uh, one method for doing scans on uh, with pregnant women and um, uh, the fetus that's inside them. Um, so if you look at the table on the left-hand side, uh, it gives the range um, for other creatures. So dogs, for example, can hear at a much higher frequency than humans. Um, and that's why a dog whistle, uh, if you've ever, uh, I don't know, used one, um, you can't hear the sound that the dog whistle makes, but um, a dog can. Um, and then you can sort of look down, you see elephants have a lower slightly lower bottom end, so 16 hertz as opposed to our 20 hertz. Um, but you can get a sense um, looking at those different creatures. So there are various bullet points here which animals can hear, can a human hear higher pitch sounds than, etc. I'd like you to go through those bullet points and um, add those to your notes um, that you've made on this topic. Um, and if you could just work through those, that would be um, fantastic. But if you have any queries again, please ask me. Okay, so the following bits that we're just going to do, or the final bits that we're going to do on this topic are essentially extension work. Um, so there, if you want to think of your extending excelling aspect of uh, year eight, then we're looking at the extending and excelling part of the topic. So I want you to imagine we're back at school um, and the class next door is being extremely noisy. And I'd like you to sort of write down um, get a piece of paper, write down how we're we able to hear that noise. Uh, I want you to consider the particles in the air and the walls. I want you to consider the speed of the sound wave through the air and the walls. And I want you to consider how our ear detects the sound. So if you could please just have a think about those things, um, jot some bullet points down and we'll look at them on the next bit. So pause the video, do those, those bits please and then we'll see what we, whether we've got things that are the same or similar. Okay, so uh, you may have had extra things to what, what's written here. So the students are talking, actually, that what that means is that their vocal cords are moving, uh, they're vibrating, which means they are um, vibrating the air particles around them. So that's going to create these compressions and rarefactions we saw, saw much earlier. And so the sound waves basically then travel through the air. Um, we haven't really looked at this speed, but sound travels through the air at a speed of 330 meters per second. Um, so when the sound hits the wall, uh, it causes the wall to vibrate. Now, we know that uh, sound travels faster through a solid than it does a gas. So the sound wave is now traveling faster than 330 meters per second when it goes through the wall. That's because the particles are much closer together. When it gets to the uh, to our side of the wall, it's going to cause the air on that side to vibrate, um, and so the sound wave now slows down because we're talking about a, ga a ga mixture of gases again. So the particles are further apart, and then eventually that sound wave is going to reach your ear. It's going to vibrate certain parts of your, particularly your eardrum, to begin with anyway, and then it gets converted into an electrical signal, and that gets sent to your brain. Okay, so it's quite incredible that this class next door 
obviously we're not hearing them at the volume that we would if we were physically in the in the room but we are getting um, if they're particularly noisy if they're loud enough we will actually be able to hear that they are present and that entire process that we've just outlined or listed is taking place for it to actually for you to get the sound or the sense of them being in the room next door so I'm just also going to take this opportunity we uh, to talk about the uh, uh, lightning storm thunderstorm that we had a picture of way way back in this video and asked you to describe about what you would see in here and uh, what I'm hoping you thought or considered was the fact that you would see the lightning before you hear the bang and the reason for that is um, the sound is because of the lightning okay so when the lightning strikes or when the lightning you know is produced it's incredibly hot um, it's about 4,000 Kelvin that's that's a similar-ish temperature to the very outside of the Sun so the air around that lightning expands very 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 quickly and because it expands so quickly that's producing a sound wave however light travels at a much faster speed uh, than sound so light travels at about um, 300 million meters per second um, whereas sound in air travels at about 330 meters per second so there's a, a large difference uh, and so it's like a race uh, taking place then where you've got light the light is much faster sound is much slower if the distance between the lightning and you is quite short so it's a short race then you might only see the lightning fractionally before you hear the sound but if the uh, if it's a if you are very far away from the thunderstorm or from the lightning then um, it's like a longer race um, over a longer race the light is going to um, outstrip or outspeed or the sound to a greater extent so the light will reach you quite a long time or significantly longer time before the sound does and so you can see the lightning and then there can be a number of seconds before you hear the sound uh, and, and actually one of the things that you can do is the difference between seeing and hearing essentially gives you an indication of how close you are to the thunderstorm okay or to the lightning okay so here's a, another sort of um, extension piece it's just going to take the echo sounding or the echo location a little bit further so this is a, a method actually for ships to to know the depth of the water that they're in if they're in an ocean or a sea it's important they don't start heading into shallow waters because they can run aground um, so they use um, echo sounding or echo location to determine the depth of the, the water they're in. So they transmit a high frequency sound wave and then that will get reflected from the bottom, from the seabed, and then it will be detected by the ship. And because they know the speed of that sound wave in water, uh, they can gauge and they can measure how long sorry, it takes for the sound wave to return back to them. They can gauge the depth of the water. So we're going to do a calculation based on that. Um, so they've, uh, if you remember that speed is distance over time, and one of the things that we want to know is the distance. Um, speed we would know because we would know what, um, what the, how quickly this sound wave travelled through water, and time would be what, what we would be measuring, how long did it take for, for the sound wave to reflect back to us. So we need to get it so that um, distance is our subject so uh, let's start with what we're starting with. We're starting with speed is distance over time. Um, we want distance to be our subject, so we're going to times both sides by time. So speed times time equals distance. However, uh, the distance um, that we're going to be calculating here is the distance from the boat to the seabed and back. So if we just want to know what the distance to the seabed is, we're going to have to divide our speed times time um, by 2. Um, so speed times time 
divided by 2 is going to equal the distance when the distance is the depth um, of the water or the depth of the sea. So when we do a calculation in a second, uh, one of the things, pieces of information that we're going to need to know is that the speed of sound in water is 1500 meters per second. Um, and then if we're given also the time it takes to transmit and receive the sound, we can calculate the distance. Okay, so let's just write our equation again. So it's speed, I'll just write it in words now, times time over 2 uh, equals the depth or distance um, of the sea. Okay, depth in this instance, all right. So we're given a speed of 1500 meters per second. We're told it takes five seconds. We know we've got to divide it by two, and that is going to equal 3750 meters, uh, which is pretty deep actually. And um, there's an extension question there. I'm just going to leave that with you. Um, I think basically you're going to need to know um, that the speed of sound um, in air is 330 meters per second. Okay. All right. So that sort of concludes sound. There are probably the odd little gap. Um, that we're going to have to fill in using the worksheets, but also some supplementary videos. But if you have any questions about anything that I've talked about on this video, please just get in touch and we'll sort it out. All right, thanks.